is 504. And the Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. All of the commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan and Jessica Patterson and Sean Enterlein and Eli Emerson. I don't think I've missed anybody, right? Okay. Um, just need to go back to the. Uh, so we have a quorum. Are there any um, modifications to the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the agenda? It would be nice if we could put Sean ahead of Jeff. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. All right. Is everybody else hearing the echo? A little bit. Yeah, I get an echo from my own. I have a feeling yeah. it might, uh, I don't know what, I'm not hearing it now. Yeah, it just went away. <laughs> Ghost in the machine. Okay. All right, so is there approval, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the modification that um, Sean goes, where, where, what are you suggesting that Sean go before where before Jess or so it's Eli Je, uh, Sean Jess. Correct. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion to approve that? I make a motion to approve the revised agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any no? Any no's? <laughs> then the agenda is amended. Um, what I noticed is that there isn't anything on here. We can do it as other business. There's nothing here to uh, approve the minutes from the previous meeting, but we can leave yeah. that till the end. Um, give me a short term memory. Somebody please remind me when we get there. Um, okay, Eli. Okay, so um, let me just I can kick off if you want. So last meeting, uh, we kind of had some open-ended, I felt open-ended uh, discussion with Fred and Vicki. I think they answered some of your questions and there was request for follow-up on the umbrella uh, coverage that I noted about in my uh, general manager's report. And I contacted Eli and Paul, and I had Eli speak with Paul to give you all kind of the uh, our attorney's perspective on things you may want to be concerned about or not be concerned about from a municipal perspective in performing your duties. I apologize. I do have a couple of follow-up emails from Fred that I'll send along here shortly too. Uh, but Eli is uh, was aware of those, and I'm thinking he's probably going to speak to those topics in his discussion here. So there you go, Eli. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I think the sort of the question that I um, am understanding that would be helpful to address is really um, what sort of a potential liability for you all as commissioners um, serving on the. Oh. Yeah, there's an echo. Okay. So, well, someone. Probably need, to Probably put, need to put people need to go on mute. Go on mute. Besides, me. Besides me. But if we mute ourselves? Yeah, there you, you should be an option to. Yeah, there you go. Lynn, you're muted, but you're talking. I was saying only unmute if you're speaking, and I didn't. All right. Has that echo disappeared? No. Mike, is it po you're lighting up when I'm speaking, so it's possible you need the mute. Need the mute. All right. How about now? Perfect. Okay. So the 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 sort of the I guess the big picture question to help frame the, the discussion was what's the you know as as um, commissioners. Um, serving on this board, uh, what is your potential sort exposure 
of liability and you know what might be an appropriate insurance coverage to get for that. So I, I had to piece this together a little bit. I mean, it's based on you know my limited experience, I'll say, you know, just under 20 years, but Paul Giuliani's more than four decades of practicing. I talked to our um, captive insurance folks that help try to come up with appropriate insurance coverages. And then I um, got some in information from VLCT. So I think your instinct instincts are correct that there's sort of a heightened concern about people serving in your position these days. Um, and it's uh, it's not an uncommon question and probably an important and appropriate question to ask what kind of director and officers uh, coverage you have um, to cover you guys in a lawsuit. So I think it's a good question to ask. Um, the sort of the perspective to have that sort of helped inform my thoughts about this are really a couple of things. You know, I, in representing electric utilities and other municipalities have never had this become an issue. Um, you know, this coverage um, hasn't been a huge issue in the past. I talked to Paul Giuliani and he wasn't aware of any issues in, in his uh, career um, that specifically went towards um, commissioner, select board, trustee, uh, liability for serving on boards. I think that one, there's a strong um, legal protection for volunteer, I should say a, a, a robust uh, legal protection for people who are serving on volunteer boards. Um, but in the information from VLCT, this is the perspective is that the, um, call up the email, that under the, so 10, there's no other, you know, they insure 94% of the municipalities in Vermont and there's, to their knowledge, nobody else has ever purchased specific DNO coverage. Um, I think that should say a lot. It doesn't mean in the, you know, the, the past isn't a guarantee of what will happen in the future, but at least nobody in the past that has bought insurance through VLCT has purchased specific coverage for this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt for one second, Eli, just to point out because it may make a difference from a fact standpoint. Yeah. Um, we're volunteers, but we do get paid a very small bit. But nevertheless, we do get paid something. I don't know if that matters, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't. Uh, I my. Um, understanding of sort of just the general protection, liability protection for volunteers is coming through my discussion with Paul. And it was more just based on um, uh, history. Historically, there really haven't been any lawsuits that that have gone after um, uh, commissioners and trustees and select boards. Um, but the insurance policy itself, um, I guess it's of $10 million. The, what VLCT was saying is that the largest claim ever made was under was $9.4 million. And it had nothing to do with directors and officers, but generally that the um, that the limits in the VLCT insurance policies aren't really ever close to being hit. Um, also, um, I think that the, um, well, the the thing that uh, our captive insurance people said was the thing to be most important are is that it's it's unlikely, you know, the, the actual damages awarded in a, um, in a lawsuit uh, dealing with directors and officers probably from their experiences are pretty low. The thing that's most important is that the defense costs can are are sort of the thing that become expensive. Um, and just to make sure that the insurance policy, like if you have your $10 million limit, like you do on VLCT, specifically that it's there to defend, you know, you have, it'll cover defense costs 
for um, for the defense of even directors and officers, which it should. I mean, it is a it, it does include that coverage, um, and it is ten million dollars. So you have pretty strong coverage there. Um, so my feeling is, you know, based on my conversations with Paul and with our captive people and my experience and the people at VLCT, you have very robust coverage. It um, it does already cover the directors and officers. Um, the cover it will protect against the defense. You know, it'll it'll pay for the defense in any lawsuit, and that. Vermont tends to have a, a pretty strong liability protection for people serving on, you know, you're, you're volunteers, you get a stipend, but it doesn't change the fact that you're still essentially a volunteer doing the job. So I wouldn't be our recommendation that the, you know, roughly the there's value to pay for twice the cost of the policy that you're getting now to get coverage, which historically hasn't been needed in Vermont. Um, that's the thought, that's sort of the conclusion that I came to, certainly to the degree which you want to delve more into it, we can. Uh, I just, you know, it seems like at this point, I'm not sure I would deviate much than what your fellow municipalities are doing in Vermont, and they've all come to the conclusion that it wasn't necessary to purchase it. Any questions? So, so your recommendation is that we don't need the additional insurance and that uh, uh, your E&O is up to date in case we get sued. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, I, yeah, I mean, my recommendation is that it's the coverage that you have now should be sufficient and historically it has been sufficient. Any additional amount that you pay is probably, um, not going, it's, it's above and beyond, you know, if it were a fraction of the cost of what it is, it might be worth the potential that you'd exceed all historical experience with it. Um, but it's not a fraction of, of the cost. It's almost double the cost to get something which seems highly unlikely would happen. Is that, is that, oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. I was gonna say, so that cost, uh is that cost is from VL, vlct uh and they're not underwriting it i mean they're going through a secondary they're going to a secondary market and um i mean i know they're i mean it's just amazing how much it can vary from you know one specialized uh underwriter to another so i, I don't know if you know they just got one price or if there's any way to shop around for for additional uh, prices. Um, that, that's they went to multiple vendors. Went to multiple vendors. Okay. So, and, and would that be with them as uh, an intermediary, uh, or would it be a direct, a directly underwritten from the uh, vendor? Because that, that could have substantial effect on the cost too. Yeah, all I uh, can tell you is that they all said 50k minimum and they wanted to know if that was a deal breaker. And I said, probably, but stand by. That's a lot. I, I had a couple of questions, um, not just about the DNO coverage, but the general liability coverage. And I guess, but one of the questions that I have, Eli, is um, have there been Dam failures. I mean, that's to me, that's one of the things that I see as a as a significant source of potential liability for HED. Whether it may or may not be, you know, a liability for the directors, it's liability for HED. Because if if Wilkett Dam fails or Macville Dam fails, there's a lot of property downstream. Um, and it could be property damage, it could be, it could be people being killed. Um, and, and I don't have any experience with claims in Vermont, but I could, I could see how it could easily exceed $10 million. So I certainly um, have no experience. I mean, I'm not even aware of a significant dam 
failure in Vermont, let alone ownership by a municipality and then liability as a result of that. It did VLC, VLCT did say that they're they insure Swanton um, and Hardwick. Swanton has significant hydro assets. It might be worth. Um, I mean, it, I, like if they're going to insure Swanton, then I would imagine that they would want to take into account the potential liability exposure from a failure of what is a huge dam that is, is you that know. The one by I-89 on the Lamoille? No, it's, um, well, you have to go off of 89 quite a bit. It's upstream, so, um, you know, no, it's upstream of downtown Swanton. There's a dam that you can see from the interstate. Uh, it's yeah, at Highgate <laughs> Falls, it's on Route uh, 78. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's. Um, I would imagine their exposure there. It's a much larger dam. There's, um, I mean, it's it's got a large reservoir. It's a large dam. It's got at least it's got uh, Swanton, the entire Swanton community downstream of it. Um, it seems like that VLCT would have considered their potential exposure from insuring Swanton Electric. Um, does, so does I mean, it? oh, sorry. Because we've only got a million dollars in coverage for covered dams. Does anyone know what, uh, for example, Innsburg Falls, for example, has for coverage for dam failure or, uh, or anyone else, for example? That's not yeah, provide some guidance. Do not have the foggiest idea what Enosburg has for insurance coverage. Yeah. Any in any case, that's that's one that that struck me as a potential source of of liability where we could easily exceed the amount of coverage that we have. Um, yeah, a million dollars to cover legal fees. <laughs> It, it might. It's, it's, it's peanuts a million dollars if there's a damn failure. Yeah, no, I, 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 this is why I'm bringing it up. Um, so that, that concerned me. The other is somebody getting electrocuted, a kid climbing a pole or climbing over the fence at, at, at the substation at um, Wilkett Hydro or better still not a kid, but somebody who's 22 years old who has, who has children and has a job. Um, I know this is Vermont and I'm guessing, you know, this, we're, not, we're not talking, you know, New York here, but I'm, I'm that's the other kind of cover. And so, so, I mean, I think because we're an electric utility with hydro facilities and dams, we're certainly differently placed than a municipality that doesn't. I think there's a different set. Now they may have other risks that, you know, uh, but, but yeah, that's, I, that's, that's what concer that, that concerned me. Yeah, um, I would say that the, it doesn't sound like, um, from VLCT that they're, you know, that's not a, it, they don't have a ton of municipal electric utilities. So that's not where their primary focus is going to be on do the potential we, exposures. Who's, who, do you know, or can you find out who's insuring the other utilities that you represent? I mean, uh, maybe I can, we should, I can yeah, ask. Maybe we should be VLCT, but maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. I can, I mean, I can certainly ask if you'd like me to, I, I represent pretty much all of them. It's not, it's not, it, but it's obviously not a conversation that come up, that comes up that often. I mean, and roughly, roughly half of them own hydro too. Yeah, it sounds like we should get some more questions together from the commissioners that I can pose to Fred and get feedback from our sister municipals through VEPS uh, get some more data for you guys to work with. Or, yeah. or, so, or some of the co-ops that wouldn't be getting through VLCT. And it, it's a kind yeah, of they may thing. have a captive insurer, I don't know. 
Well, I'm sure they use NR, NRECA services, and we are an associate member, so I'm sure we could access that as well. Well, it seems to me that we should at least be finding out what comparable coverage would be costing us from NRECA. Um, and NRECA may have some sense of uh, what kind of claims have been out there or what kind of exposure has been out there for some of the kinds of risks that as a, as a utility we face that immunity might not. Do folks think that makes sense? Uh, is there any um, like case law for in Vermont for dam failure, exposure, that kind of thing? I know of absolutely none for dam failure. I feel like um, there's been, not with any of our clients, but some case law recently of injuries uh, related to, I think they're actually line workers and it may not have been electric electrocution, but you know, injury, uh, injury uh, of a line worker wall on the job. So there's certainly, there's some of that. I don't, dam failures, I, I not that I know of. Yeah. Eli, the reason I brought the, the climbing over the fence and getting electrocuted is because in the 1980s, when I worked at Commonwealth Edison, someone did that. And I, my recollection is that it was like a $4 million claim in the 1980s, admittedly in Chicago, but still. Um, the other coverage that um, where there was an exclusion was for breach of contract. He, you, you want to talk to, I mean, I'm sure you can meet first. And, and does that strike you as being odd? Well, I, I really need that. This is definitely not my area of expertise. I'm a re regulatory attorney. Uh, yeah, I know. I, know. Uh, so, I mean, I'm happy to look at any insurance policy. I'm happy to talk to like the experts in our firm with developing insurance policies and captive insurance, which that's their job to sort of think about coverage in that way. Um, I can just tell you that um, Vermont's a small state. It's, it's rare that you've had um, certain things be come before the courts and have the courts make decisions just because there's, it's not like New York or Illinois where there's tons of people and, you know, lots of legal activity. So it's hard, it's, it's really hard to say what would happen in Vermont, like what's your experience in Vermont? Because oftentimes things are matters of first impression in Vermont. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I realize that, um, and I don't know how long all the folks from New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut who moved up here are going to stay here. Um, I know the takeaway that I have from this is that we should be checking with NRECA and maybe putting together some more questions to see, uh, especially with, with some of the other similarly situated entities, whether they're municipal or whether they're co-ops. Does that make sense to folks? Yeah, so if I can get just some, you know, I got the damn one and I got, I'll be able to review these, um, the video of this meeting, but if you guys think of other things that I need to follow up on, just shoot me an email and I'll include that and uh, this will be a topic again next month. Okay, it put breach of contract coverage. I mean, my concern is saying, you know, let's say something happens with H11. We've got a 25 year contract and it, they default in our view and, and it gets to the point where we terminate the contract because they've been in default, they haven't cured, we do it in accordance with the contract. And they come back and they file a counterclaim. No, 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 no. And, and we, do, you know, we breached by terminating the contract, and now they're suing us for the balance of the payments on the contract over the remaining twenty years of the life of the contract. Um, 
again, I, I think there's an exposure there for, for HED. Maybe, maybe it's not insurable. Again, Eli, you haven't seen those kinds of situations. Yeah. No, I mean, certainly had plenty of bankruptcies we've had to go through under with power supply contracts. Um, never in my lifetime, I haven't been sued for breach of contract. I remember there were the... <clears throat> MWAC contracts back in the 1980s um, where there was a lot of litigation over it, but it didn't ultimately there's no liability the state just declared that the contracts were void when written because the municipalities didn't have the authority to enter into them so that's the only case that I've ever read in regard to that and it found no liability because the contract wasn't valid But I, yeah, I, I think yeah. these are all legitimate questions. I just think that they're, um, um, you just sort of have to walk through a particular policy and you have other entities in Vermont that are pretty similar. You know, Burlington has hydro and is a pretty big sophisticated utility. You have Swanton, Morrisville, um, I don't know. I don't think the the co-ops, none of them own hydro. Washington does. Lindenville is another one that I would compare yeah. us to. Lindenville. Okay. Well that's I think I think that's a list to start with. Makes makes you know with those five and see Enosburg. Jacksonville. Um yeah, I think the hydro is separate from the breach of contract. Issue. Yeah, no, the breach of contract isn't just an electric question. It's, 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 you know, it's a more general question. <clears throat> it, it, it would apply, the concern would apply, you know, for any kind of, of large contract. Uh, what makes this different is I suspect that most entities don't enter into contracts for 25 years. Um, where the, the stream of payments could be quite large if the, but um, <coughs> and, may, and maybe there are other mitigate, mitigants on, on that particular risk because we have a right to buy out the contract after a certain point too. But um, anyway, but I, but I, I think the liability is, is the bigger concern. All right, well, I'm sure Mike will tell me if he needs any assistance in that. But. Anybody have anything else? No, thank you, Eli. Yeah, have a great night. Happy holidays. You Take too. Care. Thank you. Okay. So, Jessica. No, it's Sean it's going to talk to us about our purchase. Oh, Sean's going to talk. Okay. Okay. Hello, Sean. Um, may I want the screen, I Sean? I would love to. Thank you. There we go. Oh, I'm still disabled. You can share. Let me know when I can share mine. Yeah, tell me how to do that again. I'm not super familiar with WebEx or um, Zoom. Make, make him a co-host for right now. Ah, that'll work. And, and I will and never not to end your meeting early. That's what happened last time or something happened like that. Handing it back. There we go. So um, I just have tables and pictures for you today to let you know how the decision you supported ended up affecting your power supply portfolio. Um, can you see my screen? 
Thumbs yes. up. Yep. yep. So these are the exact same tables I showed you a month ago. Uh, your current contract with Nextera is 1.9 megawatts on peak, and and you just recently bought a couple of megawatts, one at a time, 23 and 24, rising through the latter half of the five-year period. Similar story, but different numbers in the off-peak. You presently have 1.2 with Nextera. You're just buying one, rising to 1.5. In terms of renewable energy credits, you've now got uh, basically almost 9,000 for the next few years, rising to 13. And what does that look like? This is your new supply and demand chart. So if we walk up this from the bottom, these first three resources are important because you choose to keep the renewable energy credits here. So New York Hydro, Power Authority, Walkit, of course, H11, you'll keep those recs. The next few resources are also renewable, but we sell the recs to keep rates low. Uh, the wood-fired power from McNeil and Rygate, solar from the standard offer program, and the landfill gas from Fitchburg and Massachusetts. Um, I skipped over the black oil strip because it's so small and insignificant. I stuck it there just to keep the shape of the graph kind of calm. So as you rise up here, you see you have some system contracts you bought into um, basically a year and a half ago. It was the summer of 2019. Those start rolling off um, June of 2023, if I remember correctly. And as we talked about, the main decision was nuclear. That only lasts two more years. And you've replaced uh, a big chunk of it here with Brookfield, whose recs you will keep. And um, because the volumes are a little smaller than the nuclear contract, you're not quite hedged during this time frame yet. So Mike asked me to shade what's next. Um, we'll be coming back to you in the coming weeks to months to make another purchase that's much, much, much more shaped on a monthly basis. You'll have different megawatts on off peak by month for a long period, for another five year period is what I anticipate. Um, so it's looking pretty good. Um, I'll stop, any questions? So the, the, uh, the new plan purchase looks like we need to have that it seems relatively close at hand even though this this uh access here goes out to 2039 looks like we're about a year away from from needing to draw up on that so that seems close in for the way you secure these commitments so that's a right now need and we're just lucky that the, the market's favorable right now apparently I'd agree with both those statements. Yeah, and the market's definitely favorable right now. I'll show you how favorable in a moment. You can see the Great. the difference in price. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would. <laughs> if I was in management, I'd be telling you with a you know commitment on terms of timing and process what we'd be doing. But you know, Ken's very good at this. But he'll get us started on this right after the first of the year is my my anticipation. Great. Will this be going out just to solar or also to, to Seabrook again as well? Oh, good question. So yeah, we'll include Nextera, the owner of Seabrook in this next solicitation, um, as well as other suppliers of market power. Um, they're very, very competitive in their price. So they could very well end up with that 2021 plan purchase award, just have to see. The system mix contract down here uh, was purchased with a company called EDF Marketing. Uh, no surprise out of Houston, but they're an international energy company. So they're also very competitive. Those are my top two. They frequently, when I'm doing my monthly business to balance supply and demand, I'm ending up with Nextera and EDF frequently. EDF for folks who don't know is the National Utility. Exactement. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea that they were as that they were in North America. Oh, they've been in North America for a long time. Um, and they've 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 been a generate they were a generator i mean i i worked on a project on a nuke that they were involved with 
Well, I'm always right. happy to be in a small state and a small region and get the kind of service I get from these two big, big companies. They are outstanding. Great credit, very responsive, easy to settle contracts with. So the, what, what, uh, what is the system mix? I mean, is that a, what it says? Is that a mix of fossil fuel, renewable? It's whatever. It's just contract purchases to uh, make up for or to provide whatever the electric demand is. Yeah, forgive me. That's a term of art. Uh, and it is fossil fuel uh, with minor exceptions. In New England, that's primarily natural gas, but some some oil as well. Speaking of oil, it's a very small piece, but it's there for a long time. And to the extent that we are trying to move away from from fossil fuels, from well, at least from really bad fossil fuels. I mean, oil and coal are about the worst. Um, is there any way? Is that is that a long term contract out through twenty thirty nine or? Those are joint owned units. Project ten is the Vepsa unit in Swanton, and that provides. I wish I had the other picture here, a large portion of your capacity supply, which hedges you against the price of okay. capacity. The same thing's true of Stony Brook. It just isn't quite a, as large an entitlement. That is a peaking unit uh, owned by MWEC, uh, Massachusetts Municipal Electric Coal yeah. Cell Company. So is project, is project 10 operated as a peaker? So there's actually relatively little generation coming out of it? Yeah, it's capacity factors like 0.1, 0.2%. Okay, so <laughs> so very, yeah. so there's so there's not a whole lot that we're that I mean it really is a a, a teeny amount and and peaking capacity is going to be fossil. It's going to be oil or gas for the most part. Unless you, yeah, I, I won't pontificate on that for the time being. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I know there could be other stuff down the pike yeah unless we get some uh large storage capacity in people's houses for peak shaving i mean i i guess some utilities are doing it to uh you know larger utilities to relatively good effect it's not just peak shaving that you need peakers for okay well or uh, well yeah anyway if if, Would if yeah. If I Vince, may we can talk about that, if you want to talk at some time off offline, sure, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. from yeah. a operating standpoint. So I have a spreadsheet if you're interested in the percentages and the dollars of, of potential savings. I forgive me for hedging my language there, but um, I can show you the savings contract against contract here between the hydro purchase and the nuclear contract. Ultimate yeah. savings is dependent on. Yeah, I'd love to see it just yeah, briefly. That'd be great. Great. Sure. Um, so I've blacked out price, not black, blued out these prices because we're not in an executive session, but I've left okay. the percentages here. Um, on average, over the five year period, the pricing of this new PPA is 16.5% less than Nextera. And as we talked about last time, that price includes renewable energy credits. Uh, not just energy. So your benefits are pretty substantial. I've just got these same little columns to hide and expand depending on what your questions are. But basically you're looking at uh, $370,000 a year of PPA cost in 23 and 24, rising as the volume and in the index inflation rises up to around 600,000. And when you compare that to the next era's pricing, uh, you're gonna on average save about $100,000 a year. That's, that's, just, that's just energy. Uh, renewable energy credits, depending on how you value these, will add another thirteen to twenty thousand dollars of savings uh, to this equation. That's terrific. Yeah, we still have some renewable energy credits to purchase on your behalf. Um, I'm not as close, I mean, I am very close to this numerically, but I'm not as close to the, on a, on a business transactional basis. So my colleague Heather and uh, 
collaboration with Ken will be purchasing the rest of those recs as the year comes up. Nice. Well, thank you for um, wading through all the detail with me a month ago. It, it feels good to get a purchase like this made. Uh, you know, markets are, are jumpy things and we are very uh, well-timed here to get, get this purchase in. And I will uh, do my part in staff meetings to encourage the next 2021 purchase to, to happen here quickly. I think, uh, well, uh, nobody has a crystal ball or I'd be rich, right? But given the amount of stimulus and everything that's going on at the federal level, 2021 could be a good year for energy demand. And I would like to uh, get in front of that. <laughs> so, yeah, makes sense. Does anyone have any other questions for Sean? We can get, go back to a regular screen unless. Can you can you send those slides to Mike, so that they uh, can be okay. distributed to folks? Yep. That would be great. So if I drop off, I'll, I'll make sure I don't um, do it as a host. So have a good evening. Can't good hear holiday, you, Sean. Everybody. Thank you, Hi, Sean. Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Boy, I'm going to talk to you a moment here because all I see is an end button, which makes me feel an awful lot like I would drop everybody. Uh, um, I think Mike, what, let Mike take away his co-hosting. There we go. I'm making you host again, Mike. Hey, Mike. Now I can leave. There's my button. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Have a great holiday. Thank you. Okay, Jessica, I'll get it right this time. Okay, so if we look at, uh, we go to the board folder. We're looking at page, looks like page 18 is the start of the COVID information. The VCAP program ended on December 15th for our customers to be able to apply. We had 101 customers apply, total of 66,000, almost $67,000 that we, that Hardware Collector uh, customers received. How many were eligible? Uh, everybody who, well, let's see, I would say uh, 101 of them were eligible. I think I had to deny 15 because they didn't have arrearages or they just barely paid money because they, you know, they knew that we were gonna, the disconnect moratorium had just gone away. So they paid it, you know, like 300 bucks, which that took care of their back balance. So. Were there customers who we think would have been eligible if they had applied, but who didn't apply? Oh yes, oh yes. I, I know of three customers that we hit up, we hit the customer up, we did door notes, we did phone calls, we did the um, the landlord um, trying to get them to apply and they didn't. You said three, so was it most of the customers? I mean, this is a very good story to tell. If we got the word out and most of the customers who could have taken advantage of this program, did take advantage of it. They did, yep, yep. So it's, yep, it's really a handful who, who didn't, is, is, is your sense? Exactly, yeah, the, the handful that didn't, we, we did make every attempt to get a hold of them, to talk to them, to walk them through it, and they just chose not to, so. Wow, well, wow, terrific job by the staff, just incredible. Um, is the program closed? It was closed, and then I got an email this afternoon saying that they were going to they were going to open it back up for another three hundred thousand dollars, which 
everybody in the state, the three hundred thousand dollars is probably going to be gone tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. What was the uh, most effective uh, in getting people to respond, Jessica? Or do, do you know? I would say our phone calls, the two, the two rounds of phone calls. I saw um, even the ones that we left voice messages on. The next day, I would see a lot of applications on the, the VCAP program. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I'm not sure how long that 300000 that they just put, that the government just put back to access is going to last because they opened it up to, what was it, water and sewer as well now? So. Well, yeah. If if I'm understanding the um, the age trial balance, looking at November against the earlier months, while the 30 days is kind of constant, it go kind kind of goes up and down, but November's kind of average. Yeah. But the longer ones are way down. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we did start receiving, we started to receiving funds um, probably a week after I started approving applications. So the old, the out of the sixty six thousand, I I'm just waiting for four thousand dollars left. So most of that reduction is from VCAP money. Yeah, we did receive quite a bit in um, November. Because the variance against last year for November is teeny. Yep. But do, is there any? Do you have any feeling for uh, if there isn't any additional assistance that a lot of this aging is going to move forward? Then it's going to then become un, unpaid. Uh, I, I, my personal feeling is that we're coming into the colder months. The the arrearages are going to get a lot higher, especially now that we can't, you know, with, with the restrictions on disconnecting and the temperature and everything, those, those people who are behind are still going to be behind, and winter is usually a hard time for them anyways. Um, you know, we see a lot of people try and catch up with their tax rebates come in. So, but yeah, I do believe, I think that we're going to see that, that grow in January, February area. Jessica, what are the limitations, the weather limitations on disconnections? Uh, it's got to be above 10 degrees for 48 hours. Overnight, uh, for 24 hours, you have to four, so it's got to be over 10 degrees. Um, it's higher if there is... Uh, 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 elderly person living there. I think it's. I think that's 20, 20 degrees. Um, but the you know. So every time we go and disconnect, we've got to look at the weather, and make sure it's forty eight hours. Um, but then tomorrow we'll like, today we might only get ten people disconnected. Where we have fifty to disconnect today, we might only get ten people disconnected. Look at the weather tomorrow. Now it's going to be below ten, so we can't disconnect any of the remaining forty people. How many people have we actually disconnected in the last year? Uh, in the last year, we haven't really disconnected anybody because of the moratorium. How about two years ago? Um, Mike, do you remember your report that has, from Debbie or Leah? Does that ring a bell to you? Mike, scored yeah, the number doesn't ring a bell. Mike's on mute. Oh, Mike's on mute. <laughs> I can hear him because he's upstairs, so I can hear him. Oh, through can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's many hundreds, Mike. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. And, you know, there's all kinds of rules we have to go through. Jess is just hitting a few. We can't disconnect on Fridays. Can't leave people disconnected over the weekend. There's, there's probably, what, Jess, two dozen rules we have to follow? Yeah, and then you know, you're, then you've got the winter time where you've got to make the winter reminder. So you've got to make sure you speak to the customer before you can even disconnect. Then you got to do door notes, and then you got to do phone calls, and then 
yeah, it's it's a lot of hoops to jump through before we can even think about disconnecting the person. And if someone sets up a payment plan, then we don't disconnect them. Correct, correct. As long as they stay current with it, yep. And we have had quite a few customers um, who, who have made arrangements. I think the longest one I've seen that we've scheduled um, for an arrangement is out uh, about eight months. So, but we're trying to keep the arrangements short, you know, not tell the customer, you I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll work with them, but we'd rather not tell them that you can go 40, you know, 24 or 48 months. <laughs> so. What, what percentage of people that are disconnected or reconnected, like on average? Oh, I think maybe we've got a couple camps that have been off forever, but yeah, we, everybody comes typically comes right back on within a few days i would say within a day many within hours what what concerns me right now is and and i imagine that hardwick is probably average or worse than average <coughs> in in the state is that the numbers i'm hearing on food insecurity in vermont is like 1 in 4 Jeez. Yeah. That's and there's no reason to think that that's going to improve this winter. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. And cases, you know, cases are up. I can tell you, you know, my own experience with a business that that we own, and we've had to close because people have been, you know, not. We're open fewer hours because we can't get employees enough to be open our normal hours and we've had to close on at least one occasion um, for a couple of days because um, staff had been potentially exposed and we were waiting to get results back. Um, and I know we're not alone. Um, and um, you know, I think it's gonna persist through the winter. Um, so it would seem to me that you know, if people are struggling to have enough food to eat, um, so, you know, this is probably not the time to be pushing people to do a six-month or an eight-month payment plan, especially through you know with the winter, and that letting them know that they can go on a longer payment plan. And what ha I, I don't know. I mean, what happens if somebody miss you know doesn't make their full payment? Then they're removed from the arrangement. Can they then do another arrangement or do they have to pay everything before they can do another arrangement? We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't make them pay everything, but we'd make them pay you know, a chunk of it before we go into another arrangement again. It isn't, I, it isn't that simple, Lynn. It's, did they break the arrangement and get disconnected? Because if that happens, we go into a whole nother different flow chart. That's what I suspected. That's what I suspected, which is why it's better not to disconnect people in the first place if we have an alternative. And if we can do a 24 month or a 12 month or a 24 month or whatever we can do as a, a longer payment plan, which would then reduce the amount that people have to pay on a monthly basis. So long as doing that isn't putting us in a position where we're going to have a problem for our ratepayers as a whole, and I don't have the sense that that's the case, then I, my view is is that is that we should be as as you know we need to be fair, but we need to be as generous as 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 we can be. Um, yeah, the 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 instruction I gave was. To Jess was that we should be working much harder than normal during these times to help people with payment plans. And I have not circled back with Jess. We haven't spoken about it for I don't know at least a month. But uh, I will circle back and we'll get we'll get that back on track. Yeah, and the key, the key thing is because of the great work done and the good fortune of having that additional support. Uh, in the relief money is that now we're at least starting from a point where we're not in a hole. So we're kind of at a normative level. I, I think that's what the numbers show. So 
we can watch it month by month, but I'm all, I, I, I agree with Lynn that fortunately we're in a position to really extend and support people. And, and I wonder, I, this is, you know, way beyond what I really understand here, but to the extent, you know, the, the, the economic conditions persist, if someone was agreed to a short-term payment plan and they're having trouble and they reach out, um oh well, we would definitely work with them yeah. yeah why not do a longer payment plan you know don't i wouldn't deny anyone a longer payment payment plan that no, would be my it. sentiment yep yep i agree with roger i i think if we don't have to put people in that position in the first place of, of having to ask a second time because sometimes it's very hard to ask um I think Roger's right on that, you know, we are sitting in a very good position and we're in a good position to help our ratepayers right now. So we should be doing that. And is our payment plan now without interest? Have we decided not to do interest for a certain period of time? You guys reduced the interest as of November 1st. Yeah, what was it, 3% or something? Uh, and I mean, I, I completely agree that we should be part of the solution, helping people when possible. But at the same time, uh, uh, given actually, it does, this doesn't contradict that. But uh, given, I think they're going to, from what I can tell, they're going to be cumulative financial effects that uh, are are building up right now. You know, food insecurity, uh, even with stimulus that could expose that are going to could put, potentially cause a lot of defaults and late payments and that's one of the that's why i asked that question earlier if you had a sense jessica and that it could um just looking at the long-term financial exposure for hydro electric i mean I, I i guess the situations can be addressed as they come up but it seems like a big enough wave of financial instability that uh, thinking about uh, how to hedge against it, uh, I, I, you know, I, I mean, this, uh, I guess what I'm saying is fairly general, but I, I just have a, a not a good feeling about the next, you know, six to 12 months. At least as far as uh, uh, financial stability of a large segment of the population goes and ability yeah. to pay bills. In our so local, Lynn, were you yeah. were you um, <clears throat> that you would like Hard Rock Electric to do their own disconnect moratorium? Is that is that what I was understanding you were saying, or no? I'm not. Uh, no, I, um, I, I'm. I guess what I'm saying is that while at uh, being as generous as possible, let me jump in here because we've yeah. already filed with the commission on what we are going to do, and that is that we are going to work to extend beyond 12 months when we can or when a customer needs it and work harder than normal to accommodate our customers' needs. And that's that's where we are at. I mean, that's what we should be doing. And if we're not doing that, then I need to fix that. No, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. But I, the being able to, you can, you can only work with people if they can pay and, uh, you know, or, you know, re make, additional arrangements, but what I'm saying is financial circumstances can, despite best efforts, still keep people from paying and based on the uh, uh, economic situation, which I see accumulating over, you know, the, the near term future. And so I, I guess I don't, uh, this is a just general discussion of potential uh, financial liability for a larger and larger number of people be not being able to pay. And that an extended payment plan isn't gonna necessarily solve this as far as cash flow goes for Hardwick Electric. I mean, does anyone else have that, uh, see this as a potential problem? Just um, an increasing number of... Uh, uh, I see it, I, I follow what you're saying, Vince, I think there's the potential out there. In fact, you know, potential could even be probable. 
but we can monitor that month by month, meeting by meeting, and adjust our course if we feel it's necessary. The key thing that I heard was that we're not doing, well, we would, in the winter time, they're less likely to happen in any case, if I understand it right, the disconnects, but we're not yeah, doing right. disconnects. So that sort of suggests that the system's working the way we want. And if we get into a mode where that possible situation develops and people are coming into disconnects, I think we should make it an agenda. I think we should every month talk about it and consider changing our policy. So in effect, what I'm doing is I'm, ag I'm agreeing with you subject to let's, let's appraise the situation when we get there as opposed to try to anticipate it. I, 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 I agree with Roger. And I think, I think we, we have the luxury of being able to do that. If you look at the bank statement, we, we have some cushion. Unless, unless I hear from, from, from yeah. Mike that there's some <laughs> large number coming up that's going to change that quickly. Mike? Nothing that I'm aware of. It took me a minute to unmute. No, there is not that I'm aware of. We look good. So, so I, think, I think, Mike, if you just put this on as an agenda item, I think just so that we don't let it fall through the cracks, um, that we look at this each, each month. Um, and, and if the situation were to change precipitously and quickly, is nothing to preclude having um, an emergency meeting if, if we need to. Yeah. And the existing, the benefit of not suspending the disconnects is that it does give you the, a greater probability you'll actually engage with the customer and that they'll have to talk to you, you know, that because there is the risk of a disconnect. And so if, if you came to me and said, and could, could document that you'd talk to a customer or that you had tried and tried and tried and use every reasonable effort to talk to them and they were just dodging and they weren't being constructive at all and it became spring and that led to a disconnect. Well, then I'd say that that's an appropriate disconnect because you've done everything you can to work with them and there's obviously right. something else wrong. So maintaining the disconnect just helps you separate those circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yep. I, I, I'm, I I'm so. highly confident that if you guys were here on a disconnect day and went through a process with us and saw all the hoops we have to jump through, you would be surprised. You're not eager to do it either. Exactly. Yeah, well, it's good. <laughs> the, the other thing we should be aware of is, is that the PUC could reinstate the moratorium. You know, we don't know I mean, if things get really dire, there right as now. Was, was talking oh. about there, there may be decisions that are taken out of our hands. I was just talking on mute, sorry. I asked if there were any other questions um, on, on this or anything else for Jessica, uh, because if not, she could sign off. Thank you, Jessica, as usual. Have a good night, everybody. You night too, night. have a wonderful holiday. You too. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Bye. 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 which takes us to the general manager's report. Any questions, comments? Looks good. I had one question. What's the status with H11? Mike, you're on mute. Yeah. Yep, the status is that they are getting ready to clear the trees on the east side of the project. And there's quite a bit of timber in there that's worth some money. 
So I fed, and they actually expanded the cutting from the original plan. So I touched base with them, I think, uh, two weeks ago and said, yeah, I see on the schedule you're due to start the clearing, yada, yada. How are you going to reimburse us for the timber value? <clears throat> and what that wasn't a popular topic. What does the lease say? Uh, well, the the attorney for them, his name's Phil, he tried to say that, oh, well, we factored in the timber uh, money to pay for the clearing. And I said, well, that isn't how logging works. Yeah. So yeah. we we are, uh, I told him that he could give Hardwick Electric the money they carried in their original cost, you know, model. So if that was a dollar, you give us the dollar you were going to pay to have the place cleared, and I'll take care of it. And I guarantee we'll make money on that. So where do things stand? So Phil is going to give me that number. And then I'm going to use the same logger who lives right there to clear the property for us and uh, sell him all the logs. Otherwise, we get nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I told them. I said, my uh, Hardwick Electric's customers aren't interested in throwing away ten thousand dollars or more in timber. They, they want that money. So that's where I'm coming from. Sure. Sure. Well, your offer is reasonable. Reasonable. Yeah. So when when are they scheduled to? Uh, when do they think they're going to be going into service at this point? Mike, you there? You there? Unmute. Might have lost. Mike. I lost him from my screen. I see. Mike, he shows up on my screen, but he Mike, shows up as muted. You're muted, Mike. Sorry. You hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yep. Sorry. So yeah, they're still saying spring. They're they're on track with their proposed uh, schedule original. They did run into some ledge I talked to you all about, and they core sampled that, and they figured out how they're going to uh, build build the foundations in that section. They're going to be a pier, a little different setup. Um, but other than that, I'm kind of in a holding pattern with them right now, too, because they need to do all their trenching for their conduits and cabling and everything. And I need to run power cables, uh, high voltage cables across there, too. And I need to know where the transformer is going and, you know, where the last pole can be set in their permit, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of at a standstill. But our project is right there, ready to pull the last trigger on the last, you know, 400 feet, and we're done. But in terms of their obligation time-wise, are they on schedule or are they behind schedule? I would say they're a couple of weeks behind schedule uh, from what the plan was, maybe three weeks, actually. But the work that they have ahead of them, the trenching and the conduit work and driving piles, they can just get more bodies and do that in less time. And, and I, I saw the Novus project that Roger likes to watch across the hillside there. And they actually put that thing up in a matter of days, the whole thing. And I know it's only a third the size, but uh, more bodies make these things go really fast. The one on 100 is their project, isn't it? Uh, it's whose? Encores? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I and mean, that went up very quickly. Yes. Now they didn't have to clear anything there, but it was, you know, it that that looked to me like it might be a, about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller. No, it's actually a little bit bigger. That's a two point one megawatt. We're a one point six. Um, the only thing I want to say is well done on the inventory audit. That's great. 
Was there anything uh, unusual that, uh, what was the, what was in the 2%? Was it like all toilet paper? Ask me that again. Uh, I, was, I was just saying if anything un unusual was part of the 2% that it wasn't accounted for. Uh, no, actually it was pretty funny. The, the biggest error was that we were missing a couple of power poles. And, <laughs> and uh, Reno prides himself on his errorless pole log that he keeps on every pole we set all year long. Well, guess what? We found two out there that he forgot. So that was a good one. So you found them. It wasn't that they were missing. You found them. We did find them. Yep. Yeah. They, those would be big things to lose. Um, I had a question um, on the key indicators summary. The... Um, our dollar bill, looking year to date, which is through October, so you know we've got plenty of COVID in there. We build slightly more, six tenths of a percent more than we had budgeted. What, what page are you on, Lynn? I'm on page seven of the PDF. So, so we spent, we build more, with, um, but we actually purchased and generated less. Um, so, so the budget kilowatt hours are down by 1%. And it just, uh, I, again, this is, these are budgeted numbers, but it, it's something we should just watch for, I think, because it strikes me that there's some some inconsistency going on unless there's some other explanation for it between um, how we're budgeting what we're billing, what we're, in other words, revenue and how we're budgeting what we're purchasing in terms of physical quantity. I mean, because the, the, what we bill is, is set by tariffs. So that's, it's not a function of, of what um, we're paying for the power, which can vary, but did that make sense to people? I'm, I'm did, did, did the impressed. price change from the actual budgeted price? It, this has nothing to do with price. Well, the amount I mean, that the we bill is, is the, by tariff, Vince. It's, it's what's in our rates. Well, kilowatt hours too, obviously. You're talking about purchase, HED's purchase power or purchase power from the-, the No, I, I'm on page seven. Yeah, I'm on page seven too. Okay, so the amount billed year to date, actual. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. Okay, is more than what was budgeted. That's in other words, we've billed more through October than we thought we would, but we've actually had fewer kilowatt hours over that same period than what we thought we would. Industrial, commercial, seasonal. Well, it's not, this isn't in relation to. Anyway, I, it's, I, I, don't, I don't expect anybody to have an explanation unless there is something that just jumps to mind, Mike, but it, it strikes me that it may just be a difference in the way we're budgeting both those pieces and there should be maybe more consistency. You there, Mike? You there, Mike? Yeah, I'm. I'm digesting the num. I'm digesting the numbers too as you're speaking, and <clears throat> we. I can definitely dive into this and give you some better information tomorrow. But my my brain isn't clicking on it at the moment. But the budget, the difference between actual and budget, is really very close, Len. It's it's more the. Uh, it's 390,000 kilowatt hours. It's the it's difference quite a in bit. kilowatt hours is, isn't, isn't huge. No, I mean, the difference in, in, I'm sorry, the difference in billing amount isn't huge. The difference in kilowatt hours is over a million 
kilowatt no. hours? 390,000. Yep. No, more. No, it's over a million. No, it's, uh, over, it's 600,000 plus for, for the hydro generation. And it's... Um, Oh, I see. If you add them both, three hundred thousand, and it's 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 uh, four hundred thousand on purchase power. So it's 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 about a million kilowatt hours out of a total three million kilowatt hours. About twelve percent. But it's fewer kilowatt hours than budgeted, by a lot. It's one percent less than budgeted. I mean, don't you feel that most of the time the the budget is pretty darn I'm close? I'm talking up? about the two, the deviation in the, in in movement. It this isn't a huge thing. If if there's, it strikes me that the numbers may be based on different assumptions or something. I I don't know. Anyhow, it's something to watch out for when we do budget. That's it. it wasn't what I would have expected. I don't want to beat this horse, but I'm I'm not with you here, Lynn, on the million. So the kilowatt hours purchased from VEPSA, year-to-date actual and year-to-date budget, the difference there is 390,000 kilowatt hours. Right. That's what I said, 400,000 kilowatt hours. I'll give you the 10. And then the hydro is off because we had troubles. So we had a couple of months, probably three or four months. So that could be you know, 300,000 kilowatt hours a month that we lost, depending on when it is. That could okay. be part of the skew. I'm just trying to brainstorm. That, well, no, you. that could, okay, that could, that could be, that could be it. That could be, that, the, that, that, that could do it. That could do it. The year to date, year to date budget on the hydro, is that based on like a 10 year production divided by 10? Yeah, they use uh, all the historic data for the last, I think, 25 years. So, so you have three months of no of no water. There you go. Right, but we actually had months when we sh would have, could have, should have been generating and had water, but we had troubles with the hydro, so it was offline. But that that could that could be part of it. Anyhow, yeah. that, thank you. I, I was just I I noticed things moving differently, and that I wondered what what it was from. The 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 uh, difference between budgeted. Um, under distribution O and M and actual is that just deferred maintenance? I think so. Yes, and it's also we've had no storm trouble. Uh, you know, a lot of hours have not been spent that we budget for. So touch wood. Shouldn't have said that. Now we'll probably get clobbered. <laughs> Uh, this is this uh, just out of curiosity. The 170k that you saved on the the direct tie to Velco, yeah, it was that is that transmission cost? Yeah, that's a schedule FERC 21 schedule with GMP. So not only do we pay transmission services to get uh, power into ISO New England, we also pay GMP to get it from Velco to us. Ah, so this is so I want to get out of the equation and put that money in our customers' pockets. Nice. Yeah, really, yeah, great, really project. great project. Speaking of Velco, Mike, how is it that we have so much money in Velco stock and what do we get for that besides money? <laughs> so they offer the owners, of which we are one, uh, purchases depending on how much how their budget goes each year and how much uh, profit they make and they put out stock purchases to us they offer us these purchases and they guarantee uh, I believe it's no less than a nine percent rate of return on that purchase but it's usually over 10 so whenever they do it we buy it and we actually do it uh, we have VEPSA do the purchase for us, and then we pay for it over the year uh, as part of our entire VEPSA package. And it's a really good it, it's a really good gig for us. Okay. Well, I'd like to get in on that too. <laughs> we have about two million dollars in Velco stock. 
Yeah, and I'll tell you, the part of the, uh, I don't know, part of how the puzzle works that makes it so lucrative for us is Velco has their equipment all runs at 115,000 volts and higher. So if you have equipment running at 115,000 volts or higher, that becomes what's called uh, pool PTF, pool transmission facilities. So those transmission facilities benefit the entire ISO New England. So the entire ISO New England pays for them. So if they go replace a breaker and Virgin substation and it costs a dollar, everybody in ISO New England pays for it on a load ratio share. And guess who's got the lowest load ratio share? Vermont. So we pay very little towards those pool facilities, but we get a lot of bang for that buck that we do spend. Great. Great. Mike, on the subject of transmission, did you hear the uh, Vermont, I think it was Vermont Public Radio commentary. It was a story on transmission bottlenecks in New England costing a lot of money. And I, I never know when I hear those things, whether they're factually correct or not. I didn't want to bother you with a, a question the day I heard it. So are you asking me a question or telling me something? Uh, have you heard? Did you hear it? No, I did not. Could you go, go on the um, VPR website? And just look for that. It was in the last week or two. It's the kind of thing, Mike, where we get questions from other people, I think, who know we're a commissioner, and they say, gee, I just heard that on NPR, but, you know, what's the Hardwick Electric view of that thing? And if it's total baloney, I'd like to know that. If it has some merit, it, it's Okay, good can I do that tomorrow for you? Oh, shoot, don't do that in January. Okay. okay. I thought you wanted me to do it right now. <laughs> Hell no. No, no, when I said go on the website, I mean, in, your, in due time. Yeah, after gotcha. all. Yeah, as a general thing, if people hear stuff like that, I, I missed, I, I listened to VPR a lot, but I missed, I missed that one. Um, you know, we, we can let each other know about things like that without running afoul of... Uh, I will comment that my experience, my personal experience uh, with VPR and the interviews I've done with them is that they are very good and very accurate with their reporting. So uh, I would, I'm would i going to guess that there's probably some good stuff in there. Great, great. Uh, a similar thing that came up over the last month that I thought I should uh, well, first ask a question of everybody here. Um, did you also receive the newsletter from uh, Washington Electric. Mine arrived and it said, Roger Prevo, Hardwick Electric Commissioner. And I thought, hmm, I wonder how I got on that mailing list. Yeah. yeah. I assume we all did. No. Yeah, that's, uh, so Patty Richards is the general manager down there. She and I work together on all kinds of stuff. And we are one of their primary support systems when they get overwhelmed with weather. And she always invites our commissioners and myself to their annual meeting for the dinner and everything. Um, so I'm sure it's just another reach out by her to okay. share information with you all. So it's just being neighborly and keeping. It yes, we have a very good relationship with them. Okay. okay. It's, a, it's a pretty impressive. Pretty impressive publication i don't know if it's 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 worth it to their ratepayers to put that much resource and money into doing it but it's interesting to see it well, I, I, I get it every month and it's um i'm i'm surprised that i'm surprised how often in a year they talk about the same topic in there yeah yeah anyway uh, um, can we go back to um, the board report? I had another question. Um, 
on page eight in line three miscellaneous income again this is income it's great that we have more income but i'm just one uh, wondering what what that is that we have 143,000. what's in there and 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 why is it so much more yeah, that miscellaneous income, uh, the variance for this month or for the month of October, the 139,000, most of that was those rec credits that I sold. Ah, the 138,000 I told you about, the, it hit, in, we did it in uh, September, but it hit the books in October. Got it. Got it. So that's the biggest chunk of that. Uh, there was another piece too. I can't remember what it was. I thought I reported on it. Um, But anyway, that's that's the big chunk of it. Okay. Um, then the uh, I had one other question. This is in the FERC accounts on page eleven, and and this is probably where I get twisted around. So the the negative because these are expenses. If it's in parentheses, it's a negative ex number. In other words, it's an expense, but if it's a positive number, then that's revenue. Yeah. So this is a just question. We've we've gone in this circle before, I believe. But okay. where are you at? Which which account I'm at, are you I'm looking at? I'm in account five eighty eight point oh four because it was a okay. it, was, it was a big change, and I wondered what that was. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to. I'd have to dig into that with Jess. She could tell you off the top of her head. All right. Um, I I can give her a call if nobody else has a question about what it is. But it just it just, it it just seemed a bit. It odd. might be the uh, that bucket truck I picked up might be in there. But well, that was what I wondered. That was exactly what I wondered, Mike. If that was the new truck, but then why would it be positive? It wouldn't it be negative? These are I would think it would be negative, yes, but let's follow up with Jess because she'll be like, oh, that's because of this and that and the other thing, and it'll make perfect sense. Because if it is the bucket truck, it shouldn't be an expense anyway. It should be um, capital. Yep, yep, I agree. So that... If you could, if you could run that past Jess, that would be great. Yeah, I got a big circle on it. It says follow up. So while we're sitting here, I went on to the BPR website. This, this article in the BPR is interesting. It claims, it asserts that local transmission grid in the Northeast Kingdom is strained and, and overloaded, and that there's a moratorium on all new renewable energy developments. Right. So what's going on with that, Nat, is I reported to you all before Mike and Vince joined us months ago about the Shi'i. Remember me referencing that? Yeah. Sheffield, the Highgate electrical interface right. uh, is the weakest part of Velco's transmission system in Vermont. It's a 115,000 volt loop that goes all the way across. That actually loops around the top of the whole state. And because of the Sheffield wind farm and the Kingdom community wind in Lowell, uh, the limitations on that line often uh, most of the time actually curtail some if not all of those wind turbines um, so there's a lot of work going on rebuilding the transmission lines in that loop rebuilding a couple of the substations uh, i was actually part of a synchronous condenser project up on the jtap uh, before i joined hed and all those efforts are working to mitigate the limitations on that section of the system in vermont So is so our, is that our world? Is that another world? Is that the Hardwick Electric? We are, Hardwick Electric is right on the edge of the existing Shi'i. Uh, and if more renewables were to tie in, the Shi'i would shift south and engulf us as well. But right now we're not in it. Okay, great. Right. But when you talk about more renewables, on what scale are we talking about? And are we talking why renewables and not any generation? 
Uh, we're talking many megawatts to affect any any additional problems. Okay. And I would say you're right. Any generation, Lynn. It's it's the fact when they built those systems, or when they built a couple of the lines, which were prior to any of the wind farms, and when they built the Belco so Stowe substation, they had some major engineering design flaws where power was supposed to flow from Velco Stowe out to Morrisville and points beyond. But in reality, the power flows are going the, wrong, the opposite way. So now all these mitigations that are happening, even the synchronous condenser I worked on 10 years ago, all of that is working to fix this screw up by Velco 15 years ago. They claim here that even some of the renewable energy products have been ordered offline. Oh, that, that happens every day, Nat. Oh. When you when you drive by and you see the windmills, not one or two of them spinning and the others not, yeah. that's because ISO New England has said, oh, no, we can't put that on right now. You can't put the other 10 turbines on right now. The system can't handle it. Oh. Wow. Okay. Great. Hmm. Does, that, does that mean Morning. that okay. the... Renewables, the ter the wind farms are producing more than the entire demand of whatever the, that circuit is? No, what it is is that it, the wind turbines actually make the system unstable to the point where uh, frequency, voltage and frequency will fluctuate enough that the whole Vermont grid would flip and trip off and go flat. And the ISO is responsible for that not happening. So they aren't going to let it happen. Well, DPR is great. But now I see an article in DPR that appeared to be a picture of Mike Sullivan. And it is. Oh. But it's, it's dated September 2018. Oh. General Manager of Hardwick Electric, Michael Sullivan, says net metering solar projects could lead to a rate increase. So that's kind of over two years old. <laughs> So yeah, I better get mine done before the. So you, uh, so you understand some of the the wind. Uh, the the origins of the big wind projects in Vermont go back to the production tax credit, and the last year that Bush was president, every president before him, and even himself, every year before. Uh, the production tax credit was signed into law as a one-year uh, one year opportunity. And the last year Bush was in office, he signed it into a two-year window, which opened the door in Vermont because in Vermont it takes more than a year to get your permitting done. So you wouldn't be able to use the tax credit, you'd lose it. So when it went into the two-year window, that's when we got Sheffield and Kingdom Community Wind. But the financial components of those two projects will make you laugh at Velco's stock deal because they are guaranteed a 26% rate of return on their investment plus whatever money they make on the energy. Wow. They don't care if they ever spin as far as I'm concerned. And if they do care, they're greedier than anybody. Wow. Is the voltage, I mean, uh, is the instability caused by voltage fluctuation or? or uh, yeah, so the, the, main, the main issue is that the lines they built to these facilities, uh, well, to the Kingdom Community Wind is only uh, 34,500 volts. So it's really not a transmission line. And even when they get up to the next substation that they're rebuilding uh, now, that only stepped it up to 46,000. So now they're replacing all that infrastructure and they're building 115 kV lines, which will stabilize the voltages and drop the currents down enough that they'll be able to mitigate all these curtailments. I've always heard that. Uh, we shall see because there's been a lot of money spent on that circuit up there. So. My understanding is that they're not making any money anyway. I don't understand how they could pay 26%. Our tax dollars are paying them the 26%. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
like farm subsidies. Great. Well, thanks, Mike. You've, we sort of got that's done now. That topic, cross that off your list. Okay. We talked I, about I, it. I had a, a quick question on the variance report. The, the transmission uh, variance, is that a one off or is that a, a consistent change to 17%? What page are you on? Uh, this is page five. Uh, it's a, the second item down. The actual cost was 17% higher. Just Transmission costs, yeah. Is that a one? one I'm not positive one? where you are, Vince, and, and it's not that you're doing anything wrong. I've got a pile of papers here and I'm struggling. Sure. Uh, pa page five, uh, let's see. It's called Variance Report. Yeah, Variance Report. Okay, hang on. <laughs> just uh, it says ISO and Velco transmission uh, charges when costs were higher. Well, I mean, quite a bit, seventeen percent. Yeah, I'm not getting my eyeballs on it right at this split second. Okay. Okay. But I'd be happy to give you a call tomorrow. Sure. sure. So, um, these were. They were so when you guys get your document scanned to you, you get she does the numbering, but mine doesn't get it. I just get handed a hard copy and I don't get the numbers, so I got to fix <laughs> that too. Well, the way she's sending it out now is really nice. Yeah, it's it's very yeah, it it's very helpful, Mike. What the, what it says here is that ISO and Valco transmission costs were higher than budget and were partially offset by lower GMP transmission costs. And the dollar the the dollar amount is very small. Twelve thousand bucks. I know what you're looking at now, but I can't find it. Sure. I mean, it, it is a small amount, but it's a substantial difference, and I didn't know what it indicated. You know, transmission costs going yeah, up. Yeah, what drives it? Yeah. And that, you know, is it a one-time charge? Is the transmission line improvement, or or is it a continuing cost? And if it's if it's ISO and, and Velco costs, it could be could it could be when we peaked or congestion on the line, or you know, it could it could be a variety of things. I'll follow up with you tomorrow, Vince. No problem. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's enough of a deviation that it makes it seem unpredictable. I suspect if you go back and look, you'll see variation in it and it goes both directions. Sure. Maybe over the course of a year. From month to month. Yeah. November minutes, Lynn. Before we get before we get there, um, I just wanted to point out to, to to Vince, if you look in the in the power bill summary at the transmission line and at the variance, the green line, you'll see that some months are up and some months are down. Yes, and my I need stronger glasses. I didn't print this out big enough. <laughs> Anyhow, I just wanted to point that out to you. Sure, yeah, I, I definitely see variances. Yeah, yep, that's great. Uh, still, I would say 17% is, is uh, noticeable. I mean, it, it seems anomalous, but you know, maybe over the course, like you said, a larger sample size, it, it evens out. It's... Yeah, so October was up 17, but March was down 28. Okay, I didn't even see that. Okay. Yeah, so oh, yeah, there are some swings in there. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like the actual budgeting is based on best guess, yeah, but it can be it can vary by a, a lot. Fortunately, it's not a lot large part of the operating operating expense. Okay. One of the things before we get to the minutes, one of the things 
that we need to be as a board doing is looking at the bank statements and at the um, checks that have gone out and making sure that, it, you know, we don't, I don't think we have to check every single item, but if there are missing checks, if there are um, items that just, it, it's not clear to us what they are, they seem funny. I think we need to be flagging those and, and at least finding out what they are and being comfortable with what they are just to make sure. I mean, this is part of the process of not running into the kinds of problems that we had before. And what I would like to suggest is that we rotate. It's not a case that everyone has to go through it carefully, but that each of us take months in succession and be responsible for doing that and, and, and reporting back. I mean, other people are free to look at it. That's a really good idea. That's a very good idea. I, I know that one, like on the last report, there was a, a, an item that said quarterly payment, which ended up actually being, I can't remember what it was as insurance or something that it was actually half of the annual, uh, it said quarterly, but it was actually half of the annual um, cost of the policy. I can't remember if what that was, but yeah, like you said, that was an example of seeing an anomaly, but yeah, that's a great idea. So, you know, sometimes um, it, you know, there are things on the, the, the check report reports that um, I'm, I'm looking for one that, uh, that jumped out at me this time um, was for a compressor for $2,400 to Jiffy Mart. Or is it Jiffy Mart? I mean, it says Jiffy Mart compressor, which although the name isn't Jiffy, so maybe Jiffy Mart compressor is, is the type of compressor and it's not a compressor to Jiffy Mart, but uh, you know, again, that's the kind of thing that. Seemed... Would you like to know what that was? Yeah, I would like to know what that was. <laughs> Okay, so the last, uh, oh, I would say the last half a dozen customers uh, in our final piece of converting the entire hardwick electric system to a 12,470 volt distribution system. Uh, one of those last customers was Jiffy Mart. And our crew screwed up wiring the new transformer bank. Uh, one of the things that is critical in doing that work on an existing customer is checking the electrical rotation of the phases serving the facility. And they did that and they wrote it down and they marked it all like they're supposed to. Um, but then when they rewired things, they didn't put it back together correctly. And they actually sent the voltage or sent the three phases into Jiffy Mart backwards. Ooh. So their air compressor motor started turning backwards and went up in smoke. Okay. okay. So we had to buy them a new one. Okay. So it was, it did relate to Jiffy Mart. It's not. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so do, do we want to, uh, I mean, Lynn, do you have an idea if, well, do we want to do that? Like right now schedule, say assign people to do it on a monthly basis. Yeah. I mean, we don't even have to necessarily come up with the whole schedule, but for meeting to meeting, oh. we can assign for the next meeting because people may have different sure. schedules and commitments at various times. So is there a volunteer for next month? I'll do next month. Terrific. All right. Whoa. But I also have a question about some of these. One of the things I saw here was a property tax to Greensboro for $64,000, a real big number. But I don't see any other ones that were paying real big property tax to. So. Yeah. No, that's, but that's, so that, just, that's a question. And Mike can answer it. Yeah, so those are the uh, tax bills are due in different towns on different schedules. And that's for all of our electrical facilities, poles, wires, et cetera, et cetera to serve the town of Greensboro. 
Does that also include um, anything related to um, the beach? Yeah, but all, uh, all they can charge us for the beach because we're a municipality, even though that property is worth a lot of money, uh, they can only charge us the undeveloped value. Same way uh, in Wolcott, our Wolcott Hydro facility is a you know, tens of million dollar facility but they can only charge us the undeveloped property value for that land. By state law, Mike? Yeah, because we're a municipality, yeah. The, the, the other thing, I, I have a recollection that at some point we talked about getting information if credit card bills exceeded a certain amount, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I believe that was a um, twenty five hundred bucks. I think it was, okay. but I can okay. circle back on that. Okay. Is, is uh, the, I mean, this is a the simple? I mean, a uh, straightforward question. But is there a, a dual signature requirement on anything above a certain amount on checks? Yeah. Any any check uh, as part of the changes made before my time, but after the embezzlement, uh, HED implemented a bunch of stuff, including any check of 5,000 or more dollars has to be signed by two people. Anything so, below that I can sign or Jessica can sign. The, and the other thing is the person who's preparing the check and the person who signs the check are not the same person. Correct which was not the case at the time of the embezzlement. So anyway, so that was, I just wanted to raise that. So thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And, yes, thank you. <laughs> but I, I think it's also good because when you start looking at these things, you learn about some of the things that we actually spend money on. Um, and it gives you some. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So then, uh, if, does anyone have any other new business? I'm uh, just going to ask a question about uh, uh, board members going to select board meetings. I mean, I haven't been around in a while. I'm perfectly willing to, to do it. I don't know if we have some sort of formal schedule or uh, if it's ad hoc or. Uh, does anybody have I just went Thursday night so this month's covered oh. and I was going to get a schedule out uh, before our next meeting and set it up for next year great great but we do usually have a schedule ahead of time yeah, yeah. Okay. and it's you know if something if you're lined up for March Vince and you can't go just let me know I'll go it's not a big deal okay great and then uh, I guess we just have a brief conversation prior to uh, showing up just to give a uh, review or, you know, represent. Yeah, I usually provide you an email with, you know, eight or 10 talking points and a sentence or two on each one. And you can take that with you and use it if you want. Right. Okay, so which takes us to the minutes from we have two sets of minutes. We have minutes from the regular meeting on uh, the 9th of November. I guess it's all, it's all the minutes of the 9th of November, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Did anybody see anything that uh, they think needs to change? All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. The minutes are approved. Um, Mike, if you send me a PDF, um, oh, I could print this and, and photo it and send it back to you. Perfect. We need so, to go into executive session. Do we need executive? Yes. Okay. okay. Then has the lingo. Lingo. Uh, sorry, I just. Uh, it. What are we doing? Executive session. Is this? Um, 
Customer matter. Public okay, um, I move that we go into executive session to discuss a confidential customer matter. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Turn it back on. So we're going in at 6.54. I shut it off 10 seconds too early. So moved. It is, the recording is back on. We are out of executive session at 7.18. No action was taken. Uh, is there a, is there any other business? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? I move. Second. Third. <laughs> any objection? Hearing Next. none, we are adjourned at 7.18.